love when meetings actually begin on time. <laughs> um, good evening, I'm Ruth Dinowitz. I'm a member of the Albany County League of Women Voters and I will be the moderator for tonight's candidate night. For those of you who have perhaps not been to a league run uh, candidates night, there are several formats that are available. The one chosen tonight, so you understand how the evening will go, is that each of the candidates will have a two-minute opportunity for an opening statement. They'll have a two-minute opportunity at the end for closing statement. And in between, they will have two minutes to respond to any questions. That will be the maximum amount of time. I will rotate each of the questions for each candidate, so nobody will always be answering first or last. Uh, we have a marvelous format tonight with many questions that have been submitted by members of the community. However, there are cards here tonight. So those of you who are here or think of a question now or during the format tonight, feel free to raise your hand. A league member will come and give you a pen or pencil and a card because no questions will be taken from the floor this evening. Everything has to be written. Um, I would just like to say two things. One is it's great to be in Bethlehem. This is a, a community totally committed to its educational system and wonderful people come out to be your candidates. I do not live here. I just love to come um, and uh, have the floor and listen to the people who have great ideas and make policy for your district. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say now before we begin is those of you who are here tonight and have cell phones, I ask that you either turn them off or put them on vibrate so that uh, nobody is interrupted during the evening. Uh, the members up here are listed as they're going to be on your ballot. This is a very good way of visually, if you don't know anybody, to understand who they are and what their beliefs are. So we will begin. I don't think there's any reason uh, not to start right now because we're on time and we have many questions already submitted. Uh, the candidates before, by lot, picked one, two, or three. And so Mr. Fishbein uh, is going to make the opening statement first. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this. Thank you all for coming out on such a lovely night. And thank you to the people who will watch this, hopefully, when the video is put online. In my professional life, I'm an appellate attorney, a certified mediator, and a court-certified arbitrator. I've been married for 22 years to my wife, Paula, who's a speech pathologist. Our son, Ben, is a 2013 graduate of Bethlehem, attends St. Lawrence now and my daughter is a junior here in the high school. I'm a candidate because I want to grow the board's ability to view issues from different perspectives and to develop three to five year budgets that balance our scarce resources with, needs, with the needs and priorities of the entire community, including students, teachers, parents, taxpayers, and those on fixed income. As a certified mediator for 25 years, I bring to the board a proven ability to develop win-win solutions to often difficult problems. Mediation skills are especially suited to the development of school budgets where many stakeholders are seeking a fair allocation of scarce resources. As an attorney, I have often created solutions for clients by not only thinking outside the box, but by looking at a situation from many different viewpoints and using my analytical skills to collaboratively craft solutions. If elected, I would advocate common sense testing, the planned implementation of any new programs, the development of new funding streams, and for example, last year, Ravina Queeman Selkirk School District installed solar panels without cost to the taxpayer and an estimated savings of at least $40,000 per year. With savings from solar, for example, we could restore some of the program cuts or even reduce property taxes. Thank you. I thank you, and I must apologize in my enthusiasm to get this started. I forgot to mention that at the very front, we have people who are showing the candidates how much time they have left. 
so that if you see some things going forward, don't get nervous. It is just the people in front indicating to each candidate how much time they have left within the two minute allotted time. Um, now, uh, Dr. Regent Singer, thank you. Uh, good evening. I would also like to thank the League, my fellow candidates, the members of the staff and faculty who are here, and community members who are here and who may watch at a later date. I'm running to continue the, to work with board colleagues and staff and faculty to implement and evaluate the goals and programs of the district in a complex and changing environment, and to identify new and innovative programs and ways to conduct the business of the district that serves students, staff, and community members, and all the stakeholders of the district. Uh, over the past six years as a board member, I've become familiar with many aspects of the administration of the school. I've served on many board committees, I've uh, related to policy, finances, and all aspects of O&M, more than I can count. Um, and the bond, um, superintendent evaluation instruments, we've hired a superintendent, I've served on the BCTA and BCUA process committee. I've also been on hiring committees, including those for the um, high school principal and the athletic director. As the vice president this year, I've had an opportunity to advise the president and superintendent on larger issues of board development and retreat planning. On this experience, as well as my professional background, as an, uh, 30 years as an organizational consultant and educator in organizational development, social justice, group theory facilitation, I am a certified mediator, author and editor, I'm a resident, I'm a taxpayer, I have two kids at the high school who've been here since kindergarten. Um, all those experiences will serve me, I'm sure we'll elaborate a bit more. Um, I also feel I bring a skill of asking a lot of questions, not just at the micro level, but at the macro level. How much, by asking questions, do we look and find ways of seeking new answers? During the course of the evening, you'll get a chance to know a bit more about my perspective. And also, lastly, um, because of the format, I will have to speak as an I. I feel this, I think this, because you want to know what I think and feel. However, in my closing statement, I will talk about what I've learned. It's not about me, it's about the we when we are on a board. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Mrs. Lenhardt, could you come for your opening statement, please? Good evening, and thank you for being here. And thanks also to the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this event. My candidacy for re-election is based on my passion for education, involvement with our community, and a strong commitment to do the job well. I have 27 years of school board experience and possess a wealth of institutional knowledge. There is much to learn from the past as we make decisions for the future. Experience matters. I have acquired qualities that are crucial to board service, leadership skills, good judgment, an open mind, an ability to work well with others, a positive attitude, and above all, a desire to be responsive and accountable to our students, our staff, and our community. When I first ran for the board, I stated that Bethlehem was a great district, but it could not rest on its laurels. I felt we could do better, and I still think we can. There are still some students who fall through the cracks and some who do not graduate. I want all of our students to succeed, whether they are academically talented, academically challenged, or have special needs. It is my hope that when our students cross the stage of graduation, they will be critical thinkers, problem solvers, effective communicators, able to collaborate with others, have a good work ethic, and be lifelong learners. In addition to my board service, I also contribute a, re a regional perspective as a BOCES board member and a statewide perspective as a member of the New York State School Boards Association Board of Directors, now serving my second year as president. I represent Bethlehem in all these capacities and give it a more influential voice when I'm lobbying against the GEA, for example, or attending statewide meetings like the SED Summit on APPR this coming Thursday. I'll conclude by saying that change is good, but experience and history are also important in the decision-making process. I add that balance to the board and the entire governance team. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll start right away. And the first question, and Dr. Widgensinger, you'll respond quick first. 
What is your position on using student standardized test scores to evaluate teachers? This is where the me and the we come together. To some extent, it doesn't matter how I as an individual feel about that topic. As a board member, and um, we are charged with implementing the standards that the state gives us. Um, if in fact that is part, and it is part of the APPR um, program, we are charged to work with the administration to implement that program. Um, I do believe that when programs like APPR and standardized testing become what I call entangled, like the, I think the original goal of testing and teacher evaluation um, may be good goals separately, but when they become entangled and uh, needlessly um, conflicted because of other agendas, then we get confused. Then we don't know what the goals were. Then we don't know what the questions to ask. So I would go back to thinking about testing. What are the goals of the testing, especially in terms of su serving students and their performance and informing teachers on how to best reach individual students as well as their collective classrooms? Um, and what is the goal of teacher evaluations? I believe initially with the race at the top, it was to increase um, the effectiveness of instruction and increase the performance of students. I'm not sure how, with the differing proportions, suggested proportions of test scores um, being fed into teacher evaluation, I wouldn't necessarily support that. But again, as a member of the board, um, and you will hear me say this several times, to some extent, um, and I realized this last year when I sat through the debate, a lot of people talked about testing, APPPR, what do you think? And I left thinking, it doesn't matter what I as an individual think, I don't believe. If it is mandated, it is the, the responsibility of the board to work with the administration to implement that. We can always advocate, and we have been stepping up those efforts with funding and meeting with legislators to, realize, to educate them as to where those issues conflict with our mission. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Lenhart, could you respond? I think what has happened over the course of time, and it started with the, the, the um, desire to have race to the top funding, is that um, you know, the, the teachers union and the governor agreed to have test scores as part of the evaluation tool in order for us to receive race to the top funds. Now, combined with that was the rollout of the new Common Core Learning Standards by, by State Ed and really not giving sufficient time for school districts, whether it's ours or anybody else's, to uh, sufficiently train staff and to also um, have a transition time for students to be introduced to the standards um, and, and especially to be tested on them. Then we have those who are um, politically motivated that, desi that decided that, well, we should include those test scores as a major part of a teacher's evaluation, major part of the APPR. In fact, the governor just proposed that it should be 50%. Now we're talking about a test one moment in time. I always felt that for students, one moment in time didn't actually, um, wasn't sufficient to actually indicate what a student could do. And the same thing with the teacher, to have one test have a, that much an effect of um, his or her score of how good or not good or how effective or not effective he or she is um, seems ludicrous to me. Um, now, do we have a choice when laws are made? As public officers, we need to follow the law, as, uh, as Charmaine indicated. Um, we, do sign, we do actually pledge, sign an oath of office to follow the laws of the state of New York. But whether we individually feel um, that 50% of a teacher's score should be based on a single test or a group of tests um, you know, seems kind of ridiculous. So I guess to really answer the question, my feeling is that, that uh, they should play a minor role in the whole evaluation of a teacher or a principal. Thank you. Mr. Feinman? Fishbein? Yes, yes Fishbein, I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm looking at all the- I was, I was oh, looking around I, for another no, candidate. No, <laughs> I will apologize. I must say, these are good questions. Somebody's handwriting, I cannot read. So as good as your questions might be, if I can't read it, I won't be able to ask it. So I apologize, and maybe the next time person will be more careful. Thank you. Mr. Fishbein, go ahead. <laughs> I am not on the board yet, so I will say 
this. As far as my personal view goes, I think it's absolute insanity to judge a teacher on one test or even 50%. Every employee and every business has to be evaluated. There has to be a fair way to do it. If I were to be elected and had to obey the law, which I would do because I'm also an officer of the court and am charged to do that in my professional life, I would see what we could do as a board, as a we, to push that envelope, to push that line, to see how, what we can do to stretch so that we don't harm our teachers because we have some really good teachers in the district and if you have a student that comes in to kindergarten and has a five word vocabulary and another student who comes in with a 5,000 word vocabulary, they're going to test very different. And if the teacher is saddled, for example, with 10 kids with a five word vocabulary and five in a kindergarten class with a 5,000 word vocabulary, that teacher at the end of the day is not going to look good on, on any kind of measurement. And that's wrong. So I would push the envelope. I would see what we can do as a board to push back on the state government, not to disobey the law. I want to be very clear about that. But to push back as best we can to find and perhaps even propose a fairer way to evaluate our teachers. Thank you. This time we'll start with Mrs. Lenhart on the next question. What do you see as the top three issues facing our district for 2015 and 16 in academics and related services, fiscal budget, or anything that you might foresee? I think my colleagues have the advantage to be able to think about this while, um, while I'm answering the question. But it, <laughs> um, certainly, the, um, Okay, one issue that has been with us and will continue to be us, with us is, is, is the funding issue. Uh, this past year, we're, the legislature responded and returned some of the gap elimination adjustment um, amount of money. I mean, that's part of our uh, foundation aid. They returned, reallocated the money to us so that we were able to actually put some of the things that we had cut over the past several years back into place. But they did not give us all the money that is, in a sense, owed us. We're still helping to balance the state's budget on the backs of our students with the gap elimination adjustment. But that's certainly still an issue, um, you know, the funding issue. The second issue, I would say, is actually what we spoke about, you know, the, with the first question, this, um, which has become quite a political um, football. Uh, I didn't finish that in the, la in the first question to say that the, the I almost look at it as a perfect storm. You know, you have the Common Core Learning Standards, you have the testing and the issues with testing and whether they're valid or not, and then you have the APPR and whether that's a valid measurement of, of evaluating our staff. And so I, the, it's become a political, as I said, a political football, and I think that that's continued to put, um, put pressure on us. Um, on all districts and us here too in Bethlehem until that is resolved. Um, a third issue is probably, you know, more generic is that um, in a sense that public education itself is being targeted. Uh, I, I feel there are people out there that are trying to cause public education to fail. Um, I feel the governor in some ways is, is guilty of that. He's, try, you know, he's trying to do it through the APPR, he's trying to do it through the testing and his opinions on testing. And, and there are also others, hedge fund managers, and other people in the finance world financing um, charter schools, et cetera, that I think are putting pressure Thank on you. all districts. Thank you. And Mr. Fishbach. Having taken the time, uh, I would have to agree that funding is, is going to continue to be, as it has been for many years, an issue. But I also think that testing and what I can only describe as now the opt-out movement is going to continue to be a source of frustration both to school boards, uh, to our governor hopefully, and to, um, and to the community because there are a lot of people when I've gone out and rang doorbells and talked to people who have said that their students are being tested too much and that 
for a variety of reasons, they opted out. Now, whether you agree with opting out or not, the, the potential downside is we don't know the result, but the threatened result is we lose funds. So there's a price for the civil disobedience. Um, having grown up in the uh, 60s, I remember civil disobedience. I participated in it. Um, and it's not something that I can, with a good conscience, say don't do. But what I can say is that it's something that any school board is going to have to deal with. I think the best way to deal with it is to try and move the legislature and try and move the governor to a place where testing is common sense, that we're testing our kids um, by testing them on what they're being taught and spending more time on learning and less time on testing by using tests that don't have poorly worded questions and trick questions, but having tests that actually measure, again, what the students are taught. Thank you. Dr. Wichensinger? Um, I'm going to speak to actually four issues if I have the time. First is, I think the major challenge is how to maintain, manage, and take an organization forward in very complex and changing times, especially when many of the issues that it will face are beyond its control, the state mandates, the legislature, et cetera. Budgeting is, is one example. Um, for example, this year we had over half of our budgeting meetings as a board uh, in the absence of state um, aid figures. But we, as a district, must be transparent, we must be responsible to the community, we must move forward um, in a responsible way, sometimes without information and sometimes with. Um, I think advocacy with budgeting uh, will be important as we move forward, um, and I think the district has been a good steward of the um, community's money. However, we will always be challenged um, in terms of running a program, providing innovation in a program with limited funds or funds that um, over 50% have to be raised for the taxpayers. The other issue, or another issue, is how we hire, train, and retain motivated, uh, energetic um, young teachers. Um, I think if I were, I, am, I always say I am not a teacher, it's not my calling for K through 12. But with all the issues that are facing people, with APPR, testing, um, issues of tenure, um, sometimes I wonder why people would go into the profession unless it is their calling. I think it has become a profession that may uh, lose interesting, uh, energetic, and really innovative uh, young people because of the issues that are uh, uh, facing it. Uh, Again, issues beyond the district's control or beyond the injury's con control. And lastly, I'll talk about the conflate, I call it the conflation of issues. Again, when APPR, testing, budgeting, funds are all um, intertwined and entangled, I believe they can create confusion for our community. They could create division. For example, people, I opt out, you don't. Um, I'm checking my time. Uh, <laughs> and um, perhaps competition between groups, and not only between groups, but beyond, between school districts that could actually come together and advocate together as a collective for additional funding and responses from the legislature. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fishbein, you'll be the first to respond to this next question. Would you support term limits for Board of Education candidates? I'm conflicted on that question, and I will tell you why. I happen to agree with something that Lynn said in her opening, that there is a value to, um, to a historical knowledge of an entity. So if that historical knowledge is totally lost, I think that that would be a, an issue. However. If I were elected, I would limit myself even if you didn't limit me. I think the ultimate limit is the power that the voters have. The problem is that last year, 3,669 people in this community voted. We need more people to vote. We need more people to put term limits, whether it's me or somebody else. If you like somebody and you think they should stay in, then it's up to you. I'm not really in favor of term limits. I am in favor of institutional history. And ideally, it would be nice to, for example, rotate people on and off a board so that you had somebody there 
who was there for, say, nine years and then six years and three, and you kept rotating them. So there was always somebody that had some of that institutional history. Because in any institution, institutional history is important. But in the end, it's really your vote that's going to be the term limits. Thank you. Dr. Widgensinger? Um, I, I think it's ultimately up to the voters. People speak with their vote, uh, whether or not they feel someone's been on the board too long, um, who they feel <laughs> could best represent the district at uh, a particular time in history. I know that as a person who served six years on the board, I have been an incredible beneficiary of the history and knowledge of the people who sit on the board with me who have been there for multiple years. Um, and to be quite honest, one of the main reasons I'm running is I realize there are challenges facing this district in the next three years where institutional memory, whether it's m decades or six years, is going to be essential. Um, we have a teacher contract to uh, negotiate next year. Two years from that is the service contract. Uh, we have two board members currently in their first full terms. Um, I think history is essential. Uh, people who have been through that process, whether it's once or five times, or ten times, history is important. Um, it's also, I believe, as long as individuals, and it's been my experience, are willing to listen to new voices. New voices are incredibly critical to the board. But I also believe balance is incredibly critical to this board at any time, but particularly at this time. Um, I believe that voters should decide who they feel could best represent them, whether it's someone with multiple years of history, three years of history, et cetera. Um, and so I don't necessarily support term limits. It's up to the individual who you believe can best serve you at this time uh, in the district. Uh, thank you. Mrs. Lenhart, please. Well, when I think of term limits, I, I think of, um, usually I'm thinking about politicians in Albany or Washington, and when they're um, brought up on charges of corruption and ultimately convicted that, you know, maybe there should have been term limits because then they wouldn't have been able to accept bribes or do whatever else that they've been doing that is illegal. Um, since this question seems to be pointed to me, I, I really don't feel I've done anything illegal or dishonest <laughs> or whatever during, during my tenure on the board. Um, so, but, uh, so I'm not sure who would ask that question. Um, but I do feel that, and, and actually around the state there are people that have been on their boards much longer than I have. Um, my feeling is if people are, are unhappy or maybe feel that a person hasn't made the correct decisions, uh, it really is, as my colleagues have said here, up to the voters to determine whether they feel the person is still effective and wants to continue on the board and can still add something to the school district and the community. So, I mean, that's really my view of term limits, that we don't need to have them imposed. They're actually imposed by the voters themselves and in, in their choices they make um, on the budget vote day. Thank you. And the next question, uh, Dr. Wichensinger will start with you. Can I ask you a question? Uh, a question? Could you speak directly into the microphone oh. when you ask the questions? Thank you. I'm very sorry. No, I, okay. I, I think it's, it's more for me than anyone, perhaps okay. anyone else in the audience. Thank you. Can everybody in the back hear? I'm a, usually people wave, but it's most important that you hear me. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. So I definitely will talk. Yeah. Please discuss the rationale you would use for deciding what items to cut in the event of state aid shortfalls. For example, staff versus programming versus extracurriculars. Um, it's interesting, sometimes people tell me if this year and last year it must be tough doing those budgets and, and my response is you, you no know, really it's not because for the first four years I was on the board we would cut millions of dollars out of the budget. So trying to find $330,000 was not difficult. I don't want to be flippant about that, but seriously, I've, um, I've been through the worst, um, and I think we're coming out of that. Um, my decision as a board, the we, is driven largely in part by the recommendations of the administration. I am not there on the ground day to day. Um, I, um, I am informed about enrollment issues, student interests, uh, what booster clubs are willing to do in the case of athletics and extracurriculars. Um, I rely heavily on the expertise and advice of the staff. However, um, I know I don't, and I don't think the board rubber stamps anyone's recommendations. 
So um, how I prioritize is based on the particular needs of the district at any one given year, based on incredible amounts of data that the administration give us. Um, I think we have to look at the overall mission of the district and develop a program that meets that uh, mission. I don't feed into the divisiveness, and it was really bad in the years that we were cutting millions. Is it academics versus sports? Is it this versus that? We can't feed into that as a board. We have to listen to the recommendations. Sorry, I get incredibly distracted by cards. I know it's your job. But <laughs> <laughs> um, recommendations, consider what total program we can um, develop, and then do, we cannot feed into dividing the community against each other, saying you're a sports parent and you're, you're an AP parent and all the rest. We cannot feed into that. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Lenhart. I think the last several years have been very difficult. In fact, I, I had often um, said to my fellow board members that they had never experienced a time when you actually were adding staff or adding programs because for all those years we have been cutting. And, and, it's, and it's difficult. And someone is always going to be harmed in the process. And we really, as Charmaine indicated, we need to um, um, listen to our administrative team, you know, what our priorities are, question why that they're, you know, they're suggesting that either there needs to be a staff cut or program cuts or go into the sports and extracurricular activities because it's all important. I think over time, and I'll mention some of that historical <laughs> knowledge, I think we actually have become more efficient because, I, I, because we had to resort to cuts over the last several years. I think we're actually doing things more efficiently now. That, you know, if there were extracurricular programs that maybe some students weren't participating in, you know, we've eliminated them and maybe added others that there actually was student participation. We look carefully at, you know, all the items to see what the value of those items is. Um, so in terms of a rationale for the cuts, I mean, we're really given that information from the administration given the data, given the information, loads of information, a lot to read, uh, and then, then we question them on why they're suggesting this and, and then make our cuts from there. Thank you. Mr. Fishbein, could you respond? If elected, I would certainly have to listen to the recommendations of the administration but I would also ask whatever tough questions I needed to to make sure that I was comfortable that we were allocating the resources in the best possible way for the community. Especially if there was a disagreement, say, within the board itself as to how to resolve an issue, I'd want to listen in any case to the community to find out what they're thinking. And you've been very vocal. I know I have stood up in front of board meetings and been vocal about positions uh, when I've advocated for a position or against something. But I think it's important that the board not only listen to the administration but listen to the public, not get involved in dividing the public, but hearing what they have to say so that at least it's considered when we make a judgment as to what to cut or spend money on. Okay, thank you. And Mrs. Lenhart, for the next question, could you be the first responder? Let me see. Okay. This question is, the American Academy of Pediatrics has recommended that high school starts times be no earlier than 8.30 a.m. Many school districts across the country have moved to later start times over the past few years. As it stands now, Bethlehem High School starts earlier and ends earlier than several schools in the Capital District. What specific actions do you think the school board should take with regard to this issue, and how important is this issue to you? Actually, this issue has come up to us, uh, to the board, and we've asked the administration to look into it, you know, to look at some of those statistics. I know a district down in um, Rockland County, Manuet is starting next year at a later time. Um, but it's not always just that simple that I can say, well, it is, we, we, we've all had our teenage children that 
like to sleep in when they're elementary, they're up early. It, it, you know, it makes sense to go to go that route. But then you have to talk. But then you have to consider the transportation issues, busing, whether that would fit into the schedule, sports. You know, um, if if students are coming to high school later and leaving later, would they be able to participate in sports, or would they be missing class in order to do that participation? Um, I, I, I have read some of the materials on that issue and, and do, um, do understand, certainly, the needs of high school students, that it would probably be better for them. But, in, but before we can actually make a decision on it, we really need to have all the, all the information and all the ramifications of doing that and how that would disrupt the programs at both and the, the schedules at the, high, at the middle school and at the elementary schools, too. So I, I think, as I said, we, we've been asked about it and, and we did look at it um, to some extent and actually maybe even waiting for additional data on it. Thank you. Mr. Fishbein. As the father of a teenage daughter, I am often uh, dropping her off at school because she has missed the bus. Um, ideally, it would be a nice thing. However, as Lynn has pointed out, this is one small piece of a giant uh, jigsaw puzzle to try and put together. Other districts have done it, so there is no reason why we couldn't, but we would have to make sure that all the pieces were in place and that we had considered all the ramifications. And when I earlier had mentioned in my opening about planned implementation of programs, this is one of those situations where you could look at, you could say, okay, we've got everything put together, and because it wasn't fully um, vented, you might end up in a situation where you have unintended consequences which are not good for students or staff or whomever. And it would have a negative effect on the district. So if we were to go to it, would have to be very careful of making sure that we had crossed all the I, crossed all the T's, dotted all the I's. Um, but again, given it's such a complicated jigsaw, it's a nice idea. I'd like to see it. Ideally, I would have loved to have had it when I was in high school. Uh, but it all depends on whether or not the district wants to spend the money to design this plan and to go through whatever changes we need, and there will be a cost to it, uh, to, to put it in place. Thank you. Dr. Richard Singer. Um, we did look at it, actually, uh, from a transportational perspective, a contractual perspective, and actually Dr. Douglas did a quick survey that night when he, uh, we had several, must have been towards the end of the semester, um, several high school students, I probably got 100, and he asked how many folks would like to sleep in, and a, a, a whole bunch of hands went up. And then he said, how many folks would want to do sports at four or five or six at night? And one hand went up. There are uh, consequences. Um, we could always look at it again. However, I'm always mindful of some of the questions we always go back to staff about, whether it's transportation field trips or this issue or others, how much staff time is taken to develop the data that the board asked for. Um, we could always look to see if it was an exhaustive study that was done the first time the board asked for it. Um, I think the larger question is how do we uh, engage with other partners to um, maximize student health and performance while at the high school, and that could be mean partnering with parents. I know it's tough to set bedtimes for teenagers uh, and curfews, et cetera, but to some extent what the district cannot do, because whether it's finances, contractual issues, transportation issues, or just too complex in terms of the larger system that this district sits in, um, just because we can't do it on our end doesn't mean we can't engage in a dialogue with parents and the larger community on how we do what we can to ensure a student performance and student health given the age and needs of the students in the district. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fishbein, the next question will begin with you. What are your thoughts regarding student rights balanced against the importance of maintaining a safe learning environment? I'd want to ask in what context. This is the question presented to me, so Unders I can't uh, you know, you tweak the, it in any way. Would you repeat the question? Sure. Again, please? It says, 
What are your thoughts regarding student rights balanced against the importance of maintaining a safe learning environment? I've always been one as an attorney that has valued the Bill of Rights and free speech and everything that goes with it. I've also understood the value of a safe learning environment. So there has to be a balance. And the balance is at the point at which uh, that a, a safe learning environment is compromised, the students' rights pretty much have to go out the window. As someone who has um, studied and argued First Amendment cases, it bothers me, but again, it's like, should you be allowed to yell fire in a theater? And the answer is no. There are some speech rights we don't have. There are some rights we don't have. So if there's a question, for example, about a weapon of some type brought into school and a student says it's in a locker, I see no problem with opening that locker and finding out whether it's there or not. And if it's not there, simple apology. If it is there, other consequences. But that would be the line for me. The board as a whole may feel different, may draw the line back a little uh, for a safety measure. And I could also be comfortable with that. Thank you. Dr. Wichin Singer. My first career was in the higher education administration. I spent 13 years writing policies that balanced um, both the, a large public university's interest and a small private women's college's interest against the constitutional rights of students. Now, higher education is much different than um, the uh, K through 12 environment. However, we know from the Tinker case that students do not leave their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse door, a famous quote. Um, the district's responsibility is to have policies and procedures in place to um, ensure student safety that also does not violate their constitutional rights. We have attorneys on, uh, on a retainer who advise us on issues of search and seizure, for example, uh, student dress code issues whenever a board member or community member has a question. And so uh, as a board member, it's my responsibility to, when there is a question, to ask the superintendent to get a legal opinion and then go by that legal opinion for the attorneys who actually work for us. Um, I believe the district can do a lot through education and partnership with its students. We have to ensure that there's relationships between key administrators like the principals, the deans at the high school, and the student government and students. So there is ongoing conversation about what are issues that are facing students that maybe students are feeling their rights are being infringed upon. Um, and also, I like to think that each, I know each school has its own sense of community. And um, in a larger sense, Bethlehem Central School District is a community. And so it's important for us to listen to students, to listen to staff and faculty and community members to see are there, are there certain things that violate these communities' sen um, senses of um, civility and, um, and just manners that we need to attend to as long as it doesn't violate someone's constitutional right. Thank you. Mrs. Lenhardt, please. In most, in most cases of student behavior, our code of student conduct, which is part of the district policy manual, um, um, lists what students can and can't do in terms of actions, in terms of weapons, in terms of you know, what they can bring to school, um, even the dress code. And each year we, we review that code of conduct. It's required by law to do so. And uh, certainly look, at, look for student input on it. Um, when, Charmaine, you mentioned the Tinker case, you know, when it comes to free speech, sometimes it's a little bit more difficult. And I think back, the Tinker case was back in 1967 where some students wore armbands to school to protest um, the Vietnam War. And, um, you know, they were told to remove them. They didn't, went to court, actually ended up in the Supreme Court and determined that uh, the students had that right as long as it didn't interfere with the education of the students in the classroom. And that's been kind of a, um, a guide to use when it comes to uh, student rights um, and, and, if, and expressing them. If they're doing something that, that impedes progress or impedes what the teacher can do in the classroom, then it would be deemed inappropriate. And certainly, uh, the code of conduct would come into play to um, determine what 
the consequences would be. Uh, I, I think um, I do agree that students do have rights and they aren't left at the door. They do have them and when they come into school, but certainly the setting of a school as an educational uh, venue is one that's you know foremost and most important and, and shouldn't be interfered with. Thank you. The next question will begin with uh, Dr. Widgensinger. Um, can you comment on whether our district's current student-teacher ratios are low enough in every classroom to assure high academic achievement? Do you support revisiting the district's classroom sizing guidelines given the increased academic learning standards and workloads for our students and teachers? To answer the second part of the question, um, I would rely as a board member on the recommendations of the principals, the assistant superintendent for educational programs, and the superintendent because they're the folks who are there um, working with teachers, seeing what's going on in the classrooms. Um, if the class, what we call class caps or recommendation ca recommended caps are too high or too low, I would need information from them to find, um, and recommendations and why. Um, we always have to, again, uh, balance that against the financial um, needs of the districts. Am I interested in revisiting it? If there's principals in the administration ask us to, we will. We actually just put in three full-time elementary school teachers because there was some concern, particularly at the lower grades, that the class sizes were too large to, in to ensure that the st students at that very early age and those very early levels were getting enough attention. And so the, um, the board heard that and arranged the budget priorities um, so that those positions group back as, as well as 4.1, I believe, uh, RTI specialists. Um, so do I think the, the recommended caps are good enough or appropriate? Again, I look for the recommendation. We can always revisit those, um, especially with the Common Core and additional testing standards. By the way, it came up that um, can, the dis can the board ever take a stand on testing? Yes, in fact, our board did this past year, I believe, when we took, made a, um, a resolution and the superintendent passed that on that this district would not participate in any uh, testing um, of uh, what's called sample or evolving questions for uh, future tests. So, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lenhard. Yeah, we, we actually had a district-wide committee around six years ago or so that looked at the, the um, class size guidelines and reaffirmed the ones that had been established. I tell you, they're much lower than when my kids were in school, which was one of the reasons why I originally ran for the board. Um, um, the problem with having, uh, having anything um, in stone as opposed to having these guidelines that, you know, if, if that can be varied a little bit is the fact that students are different and, you know, some classrooms might have uh, more special ed students, so maybe that classroom should be smaller and, you know, another class wouldn't. And so it, there are a lot of considerations we made in the actual class size of, of you know, of a room. And on the board, it's not really our responsibility. I mean, that's really operational, you know, for the staff to be able and their administration to, to determine what's best for the needs of all the students in the classroom. Um, the student-teacher ratios actually at this point um, are the lowest I think I've ever, I've ever seen them, and uh, which I'm very happy about with the additional like, of the Common Core learning standards and additional testing. I think it's helpful, you know, to have those smaller classes and you know the teachers can reach you know the individual students much more easily um, I'm really happy with that with the budget that we've been able to do that and um, and hope that we can continue in the future that we won't have any surprises of cuts from the state level but you know again we have to go back to the cutting board thank you Ms. Fishbein I don't have the uh, intimate knowledge that the two board members have uh, but I would agree that this is something that the administration is in charge of and the administration would advise the board as to what the proper numbers would be I am relieved that we did add teachers at the lower level um, I would have been happier had we had uh, the um, reading coach uh, kept at the lower level because I understand the value of it. I know the board does, by the way. This is not a slap on the board. It's a personal wish of mine because I, I think it's something that 
I would have wanted to find money for. Um, but as far as revisiting the issue, given that we do have, for, and I will take Lynn's historical knowledge of that it is the, the lowest numbers, it's certainly lower than when I went to school. I went to school at 35 in a classroom in elementary. So I look at this and I say this is luxury, and yet I also look at the fact that we have a m much different classroom than in the past, where we do have ki uh, students with special needs that we push into the class, that are part of the class, and that that does take something away from the ability of a teacher to have a larger class size. And I would like to see the administration guide the board, as I believe it does, but again, it doesn't mean I wouldn't ask the hard questions to make sure that those numbers are where they need to be. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Lenhard, the next question, if you could respond first. Should repairs, maintenance, or upgrades to the grassy athletic fields around the schools be funded by issuing bonds or out of current budget, and why? Actually, it depends on which would be the most economically feasible way of doing it. I mean, if, if, if it's better to financially to, to put out bonds, then we can do that. If not, um, you know, certainly the year-to-year -year budgeting should include that, which I think we have done this year. Um, as, as the field out there is completed and will start being used, well, it's important that we do have um, maintenance of it. I don't want to hear that we need to replace that field again. Unfortunately, that's something from the past. I <laughs> was not thrilled when we had to um, put, it, put it out for a bond. Um, hopefully, the maintenance will prevent us from having to do that again. Uh, so hopefully, like this year, you know, for next year, we do have it in our budget you know, to take care of any repairs or maintenance. So um, I feel good about that. Uh, we also, and this will be on the ballot, are looking to create a special fund that if, if, there, if we do, for some reason, have money left over, we can put into um, to a fund so that if we need to spend money on buildings or whatever, that with permission of the voters, we'd be able to use that money for that purpose, whether it's on fields or for, build, or for buildings themselves. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. My understanding is that the state provides no funding for maintenance, they, but they do f provide funding for new construction or new fields. So that may be why the board has chosen, and I don't know, uh, to bond or put in the budget depending on how they did it. But because the state is, has a tremendous amount of control here, how it's done really has to be how, what is the most economic way to do it. If, we, if there is a way to maintain the fields, um, buildings, anything, uh, on a regular basis, that to me, that's always better because you're end going to end up paying a lot less if you uh, keep something maintained and well maintained that if you let it go to pot and try to rebuild it that's always going to cost you cost you more um, and maybe it was my ignorance but for for a, a, for quite a bit of time one of my kids was still in the middle school I thought somebody had died at the middle school because of that black drape that was around the top and I I asked and they said oh no the building's full and I'm thinking, this is not a way to run a district where we have a building that's coming, the, the facade is, is coming down. So maintenance is very important. If it can be done through the budget, I'd like to see it that way. But if economically, because of the machinations the state requires us to go through, it's not the most economically feasible, I think the board needs to have the leeway to do what is best for the community from that point of view. Yes. And Dr. Vujicinder. Um, a lot depends on the size of the project, uh, whether it's a long-term project or an emergency. We do have a fund balance 
that is available um, in the event of emergencies that we sometimes may have to tap into, but that also covers lots of different kinds of emergencies, not just O&M emergencies. Um, the size of the project depends, uh, there is only so much that we can call out of our current budget or even the uh, capital reserve fund that we're uh, asking voters to approve at, on the, during, uh, on election day also. Um, so the size of the project almost could dictate whether it's a bonded project or coming out of either reserves, fund balance, or the current budget. Um, before we do projects, one of the things that I used when we were con contemplating whether it should be artificial turf or uh, natural turf with sand drains was I asked, what do we know and how do we know it? And those are the larger kinds of questions that I like to ask. What do we know about a project and the immediate need, the long-term need, and how do we know that that's a need? What is the nature of the data and, and can we trust it? What other kinds of testing do we need to know so we can prioritize a different projects? I will say in the tough budget times that uh, were present in my first four years on the board, I think building maintenance was um, on the sideline because we were trying to protect the actual academic and co-curricular pr uh, program as much as possible. Class sizes went up, teachers were fired, uh, counselors were fired. So I think building aid um, or maintenance was put on the sidelines. We are putting that back on the uh, front burner, uh, largely in part by Dr. Douglas's guidance. Um, but a lot of it depends on the size of the project and the amount of money needed and the priority. How urgent of a situation is it? Because to put a bond up, it takes time. We just can't, uh, we have to go before the voters. Thank you. This next question is rather a philosophical one, and I think it should be included definitely tonight. Um, Mr. Fishbein, the question is, and you have an opportunity to answer first, what do you think is the most important component of education in general? There are so many things it's hard to put a finger on one. According to the state, if you, if you repeat, if you go to college and you then return the following year for your sophomore year, you're considered a success. But that doesn't tell you whether you graduated college. That doesn't tell you whether you're a success in life. The idea of education in my mind is to create citizens that contribute to the community, that add value to not only their own lives but the other lives that they touch. So if education is about that, then anything that gets that goal is important. Ideally, I'd like to see every student graduate from high school and either go to college or the military, or if they want, get a job and maybe uh, come back to college later if that's what they decide to do. Um, but I'd like to see everyone be a good citizen, and any education that we can do that gets to that goal, I think is important. Remembering that every student is different, they learn differently, and because of that, it's important that we find ways to make sure that all the students are addressed. The kids that have special needs get something, the kids that are um, in AP classes are, are self-motivated, sometimes the kids in the middle might fall through and in particular it's that group that we need to be conscious of and make sure that we find ways to engage them. Thank you. Dr. Widget Singer, could you respond? Um, I'm going to also change it a bit. Um, because of the diversity of our student population, I don't think there's any single component that I could say applies to each and every one of them as a primary um, component. So I'm going to say the goals is for each student to have the ability to achieve his or her own dreams, wishes, and desires to maximize his or her potential to become a citizen of this community and a global community, um, to learn skills and not just facts, uh, to learn, have the opportunity to learn leadership, however that may look for that particular individual. As my, uh, one of my sayings is leadership looks all different ways. Um, to learn compassion, to learn empathy, 
to learn about issues of difference in an increasingly global community, to learn to, to listen to the experience of others, perhaps understand the experience of others, and to move through the world as socially educated and just individuals. Thank you. This is Lenhart. Yeah. I also don't feel there's one, one, only one important component of education in general. I mean, we, we want our, our students to graduate well-rounded. I gave a whole list of um, qualities that I thought they really should have in order to become good citizens and contribute to society. Uh, I think if we were a poor community, we might have said, well, food is an important part of their education because if you're hungry, you can't learn. Um, you know, fortunately, that isn't a major concern here in, in, in Bethlehem. But I do think it's important that, you know, that students have the opportunity not just to learn what they can academically in the classroom, but to have the opportunity to interact with others in their, um, you know, after school activities, um, whether it's sports, clubs, whatever. Um, everyone is different. Everyone has um, different strengths and weaknesses. So to be able to, to um, grow on those. Uh, and improve themselves. Uh, I do feel when they leave, they should, you know, they should be lifelong learners. <clears throat> that uh, our purpose is to facilitate their learning and having them learn how to learn, so that as they go through life, that 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 is a major part. I think all of us sitting here are learning something new every day, and um, and I think that is part of life. It's not a case of just studying what's in the uh, in your books or notes or whatever and then taking a test and then forgetting about it. It, it. What you learn should be part of what you do in the, in the future. So in terms of an important component, I think the well, you know, the well roundness being accepting of others, understanding differences in others, and, and then finding your strengths and finding your niche you know, in society. Thank you. The next question will begin with you, Dr. Richard Singer. Can you hear me? Okay. What new programs or initiatives should Bethlehem Central School District pursue, and why? I know the district is currently researching the International Baccalaureate Program. I've done some reading on that. I have not been able to attend any of the, uh, the board visits to other institutions. Uh, to allow students to have a, an additional um, opportunity that may challenge them and be more international in its focus and its recognition. I think the district should continue with and perhaps grow its use of technology. Particularly, I know it's been a particularly effective for students who have, who need additional support, either through OT, uh, PT, um, and just the ability to um, get their work done because they may have some limitations in terms of physical uh, issues. Um, and I, I don't, to be honest with you, I'm not that great with technology, and, and I'll tell you the district knows it, as does uh, Dr. D'Angelo, <laughs> who uh, also helped me quite often. But I believe there's great promise there. And whether the principals tell us, or the students tell us, I think there's great promise through the use of technology. However, we install, uh, different aspects of technology, we have to train uh, teachers on how um, they can use it to best uh, work with their students and best um, convey information and engage students, and then we have to expect them to use it. Thank you. Mrs. Lenhart? Yeah, I think the board has always been receptive to new ideas and new programs and new initiatives and uh, have them be explored and studied. Um, you know, it's been more difficult in recent years to go beyond what we're doing because of all the budget cuts we had to make. But certainly, I, there's always been an openness and receptiveness. Um, I think back to my earlier years when, you know, the, when a group of teachers wanted to start the lab school, I mean, this was a major change and a major initiative. Project-based learning, people weren't doing it. Um, it, was, um, it was quite a task for not just the group of teachers that were, were um, initiating it, but also for the acceptance of everyone else in the community, whether it was the rest of the staff, parents, and the overall community. Um, you know, and eventually we did start it. So uh, certainly we're happy with that accomplishment. But all of these things, you know, need some time to explore and study. And um, you mentioned the IB program. I did visit one, one of the programs. 
And I, I think, you know, I think it has promise, but I think we need to look at it in the scheme of all that we do for our students. You know, I mentioned earlier about the students that still fall through the cracks, and, and though there are a few that don't graduate, we still, it would be nice to get closer to that 100% graduation rate. So we need to look at all the student needs and, what, and look at programs and initiatives that, you know, will serve all of our students so that we have all of them be successful. Thank you. Mr. Fishbein. In starting to look at colleges for our daughter, we're finding that IB program has, uh, is given more weight. So it's the kind of thing that, yes, I think a district like this should look into. Uh, does it mean we get rid of the AP program? I have no idea. I think it should probably remain because it serves another niche. But again, that's one of those I we's that you mentioned earlier. Um, and I would have to do more studying about that. One of the programs I'd like to see is I understand this year there's going to be an AP coding class. Is that, is that correct? Computer, computer science. Computer science. science. AP yeah. computer science. What I don't see, though, is any real computer science courses that lead up to that. I do know, so that would be something that, you know, all of a sudden you're thrown into an AP course, but there's nothing before it. I, I think there should be some courses that allow the kids, with the students when they come in to that course, to have some readiness for it. Uh, also, um, there is a uh, coder dojo that is being started. Um, it's, it'll be in the library, it's outside the school, but again, coding, is where a lot of the jobs in, in this century are going, to be, uh, are going to be coming from. So it's the kind of program that we should have in a district that values excellence as much as we do. So that would be a program that I would like to see. Thank you. Mrs. Lenhart, could you start by responding to the next question, which is, why are the elementary teachers scoring state standardized tests during the school day? Bethlehem Central is then paying for substitute teachers to cover their classes. Why not keep teachers in class and pay substitutes to grade the test? Do you agree that it is more beneficial to have substitute grade tests and keep teachers in the classrooms? Interesting question. I think it's always better to have the teachers in the classroom as opposed to be outside for, what, for whatever purpose um, it is, but especially in this case of scoring tests. I know that's done through um, Capital Region BOCES, but again, this is an edict that comes down from the State Education Department on who can score the tests, and um, in that sense, we're following the procedures that, that, that need, need to be done. Do I like it? No, I, it's, it's time. It seems like there's time, in a sense, spent preparing for tests and then test taking and then the scoring of the tests. And I, I feel that some valuable um, learning time is lost through that process. Um, but as a board member, I mean, I can advocate, which I do do, but um, in essence, we need to follow the guidelines that are presented to us by state ed. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. As Lynn said, if I were elected, I'd have to follow the law. Uh, but I would certainly advocate for, as I said before, common sense testing. And there's no common sense in taking a teacher out of the classroom to score tests and then paying a substitute to, uh, to teach a class. Okay, Dr. Richard Singer, please. Um, I think it's already been said that if um, I would actually like to look, know more information, so at some point I'm going to ask the assistant superintendent about this issue uh, and the background of the history, although I could probably ask you too. Um, what I can only hope, though, is for those teachers who do leave the classroom to score the test, that they somehow get some insight or benefit from seeing the answers that they can then take back to their classrooms. I know at the high school level when uh, teachers are pulled out to score the AP essays, um, and particularly in history, um, I do think that ha having to see lots and lots of students' responses in writing to an answer 
um, somehow could inform teaching or perspective. So I can only hope that happens at the elementary level. The other thing is I would work, um, encourage that the board, or the, basically the district, and then report to the board on what the principals have to say and how we might be able to minimize the impact on students in those classrooms when they have substitutes um, on a regular basis or at a particular time of the year every year. Thank you. Mr. Fishbein, the next question will begin with you. If elected, in this case re-elected for the other two members here, you will be responsible for the next round of various contracts slash labor negotiations. What would be your top three bargaining objectives and how do, you, do they impact the voting public? How about a fair contract for everyone? I don't believe that I have enough knowledge to give a cogent answer to this question. What I can say is that I would certainly do my homework and make sure that I asked enough tough questions so that whatever my involvement was, that it contributed to making sure that the contract was fair for the district, for the teachers, for the students, for all the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. uh, one other thing, um, there, there are times when in budget negotiations um, where things can get heated. And there's a little dispute going on in town. Uh, some of you have seen the signs about supporting the police. I support the police, but I don't have a sign on my lawn. What, the point I'm trying to make is that regardless of what happens in the negotiations, it's important, and I know the board and uh, the teachers union have been really good about working together. I want to see that continue, and I would hope to contribute to that. Thank you. Dr. Wigensinger, please. Uh, if I'm elected, I'd be a part of those negotiations, and so I don't feel comfortable talking about what we may or may not offer or what we would be looking for. Um, I would be looking to maintain a positive relations with our bargaining units and their officers. I am familiar with the process. Um, having been through it once, it's not always easy. Um, there are things that the public cannot know uh, about negotiations, we are not part of the negotiating teams. We set the parameters for the district and the district sends in the team that then reports back to us and we go back and forth until an agreement is reached. Um, I do look for a fair and equitable contract that's also responsi responsive to the, uh, the community and I look to support the, t the negotiating team. I know it is difficult and look to support the teachers um, and also the service employees will be negotiating their contract in. Um, by the end of 2018. So I am familiar with the process. I am comfortable with the process. I am comfortable engaging my fellow board members in difficult and um, oftentimes protracted discussion. Um, that's part of being on the board. I think my experience with group process makes me comfortable with those kinds of discussions. Um, and I look to the administration to do their part, and they always have, in terms of keeping the board informed of the issues and bringing um, different possibilities back to the board for discussion. Mrs. Lenhardt, please. Needless to say, I've um, lived through, survived several rounds of negotiations with <clears throat> all the different employee units and um, certainly wouldn't want to get into any particular details or what are the most important things that we look for. But I, uh, but I will agree with my colleagues here that, you know, that ha developing a fair contract that also meets the needs of the community too. Obviously, we can't give the house away to any any group, so we need to think about the community when we're you know when we're in the process of negotiations. But we also there are times when the relationships weren't the greatest with with the units, and I just think it, it's more important you know to have that establish that good relationship, and if there are issues that come up even between contracts, that those issues are brought forward so that they can be looked at, examined, so that there aren't frustrations building up that you know suddenly have a volcano exploding. Um, that's one of the purposes of, we, of the um, uh, process committees that were mentioned earlier, that you'll have the opportunity to meet with union employees 
and whether it's the BCTA or the BCUEA and, and reflect any um, concerns that they may have and, and discuss them at that point. In the end, we want a balanced agreement that certainly is, serves the staff well, but also the community. And I think it is important to have that good relationship. Thank you. The next question will begin with you, Dr. Widgensinger. Bethlehem is one of the only school districts in the capital region, let alone New York State, to not offer a science region class option in eighth grade. This delays the science regions track for Bethlehem students and puts our children at a disadvantage. Will you consider looking into this if you are elected to the school board? Sure. Um, what I would <laughs> <It's okay>. <laughs> <laughs> but here, here's again, I am not on the ground. I don't know the ins and outs of the science program. I do know we have a new engineering track. It's a four uh, course sequence. Um, I would look for the uh, science supervisor, the assistant superintendent for educational programs, and the super, uh, superintendent to advise the board accordingly, as well as the middle school principal, the high school principal, and any science teachers. Perhaps there should be a committee to recommend uh, or look at the issue and then make recommendations. Thank you. Mrs. Uh, I kind of agree with that. Um, believe it or not, we used to offer Regents um, Earth Science in eighth grade years ago, and it was really on the recommendation of the science department and the administration to end that, leave it as physical science in eighth grade, and have um, the, the Earth Science class at the high school. Uh, that was the only subject that was considered or was offered at that time in, in the middle school. Um, but certainly it's something, as I said, you need to be open to new ideas, whether it didn't work in the past, but maybe now it would, it certainly deserves some consideration and um, exploration. So I would agree that you know, if, if, if people really want this, that we'll have the administration look into it and see, you know, examine the feasibility of it. I think there were scheduling issues. Um, I, I'm trying to remember because this is long. This is when I was first on the board and then it was eliminated. Um, so I can't remember the exact details of what had occurred at that time, but I think it had to do with the scheduling and it was felt that it was better at the high school. So, but certainly I'd be open to have the topic explored again. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. I would say ditto, but I'd also add that it's, what has happened in the past is important as I've just heard the history of it. I think it's, maybe it is time to look at it again. But as Charmaine said, I'm not on the ground. It's, this is one of those times where you have to rely on your administrative staff and you have to then ask the tough questions to make sure that the information you're getting is accurate, full, and complete. And then as a board, whatever recommendation comes down, we can look at that, make sure our questions are answered, and then make a decision. Thank you. I've been told now by two people that it is time for the, this part of the evening to com be completed and to invite each of the candidates now uh, to make a closing statement. But before they do, I would like to say thank you to all the people who gave us good questions. I apologize if we didn't get to yours, those of you at home who submitted them to the district or the people here this evening. I am sure that the candidates will stay on if you want to discuss anything in particular with them. So I invite now uh, Mr. Fishbein, I think you are again number one. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you to all of those who hopefully will view this on a video. And thank you of course to the League of Women Voters. If elected, I will carefully listen to community concerns, advocate for common sense testing, the planned implementation of new programs, and the development of new funding streams. My decisions will be based on what is in the best interest of the district, but only after considering the perspectives of all of the community members that want to be heard. 
And of course, that would be in conjunction with the rest of the board if I would be elected. So please vote for the budget on May 19th, and please vote for me. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Richard Seeger. It doesn't look as if they had lots. This looks similar to the opening statements, but they were done separately. <laughs> um, thank you. Hopefully you've gotten a sense of how I see and understand issues, how I apply my knowledge and perspective to the issues facing the district, and I'll leave you with three thoughts. Um, first um, is my opinion of myself. I have the experience and background to be an effective board member in light of the tasks and challenges lie ahead. Given those tasks and challenges, I believe continuity on the board is essential and balances the newer voices of uh, members who have recently joined the board with the experience and history of members with more than a single term. Um, then the me and the we part. Um, as an individual, I bring certain skills and experiences and perspective for the board. However, I am only effective if I understand that I belong to a we, a community board. Um, it's not about me, it's about my ability and the board's ability to function as a group. I believe my experience as a facilitator and a group process person uh, allows me to, um, to work effectively with my other members and to help them through issues of conflict when we have them. Um, and also, I want to seek to support, quote, them. Uh, it is not the job of the board to run the district. And I think one of the strengths I bring is that I, what I say to my fellow board members from time to time is I totally get this board thing and my role in, as a board member. And again, I'm only effective as a me if I'm effective as a member of the we. And by the way, that's already been an intervention because I noticed that other people have already adopted that language. So you understand how I try to work. Lastly, before I say thank you, um, as I run for a third and what I will believe, I believe is my final term, I want to encourage people to, in our community to consider board service. So many t times people in the community tell me I could never do it. And I want to encourage people and say, yes, you can. Sometimes I sit at the table very conscious of the image that I portray to the community. If you look carefully and watch carefully, you will see other things about me that I'm, I don't always share with the community. I have a learning disability, and I sit there, and for all those students who have learning disabilities, I want them to understand that you too can serve at a table like the Board of Education. I am hearing impaired, as you probably saw tonight. For students and people who are disabled, there is room at the table for you. For any person who is, oops, stop. Okay, got to stop. Thank you. Thankfully, thank the community. See, that's the first time. Usually that happens earlier in the evening, but everybody here was very good. And I'll find Mrs. Lenhard, please. Well, I want to again thank the League of Women Voters for arranging this event, and I also want to thank my fellow candidates for expressing their views and for their willingness to serve on the school board. I'd like to elaborate on a few issues. When I was president of the Slingerlands PTA, I was a member of the District's Enrollment and Facilities Committee. Our buildings were overcrowded and enrollment was increasing at that time. The committee's recommendations included expansion of elementary space. We now have additional space, renovation of existing space, high school, middle school, elementary schools, including a new school building. And certainly there is, there is room for future growth. So I feel proud of that. I, I do feel proud of that. Class size has also been a concern. And I know we brought it, up, it was brought up during the question period, but I'll, I'll just add this little story because I just remember it so clearly. When my son was in first grade, there were 26 students, okay, 26 students in first grade, and they were mostly boys. I recall volunteering in the room and wondered how that teacher managed them all, and I know when I left at the end of the morning, I really had a headache, and I really admired what she was able to do with that large group of students. While the research is mixed on what an ideal class size should be, I felt that 26 were too many. Over the years, we've been able to reduce class size, especially in grades K through two, where literacy is so important to ensure student success. The district has guidelines for class size, as we talked about earlier, which was reaffirmed by the district around six or seven years ago. Um, both the research and our data have illustrated that students who are engaged in extracurricular activities like sports, clubs, art, music, are more likely to achieve academically. Students need to have meaningful connections with teachers, coaches, staff members. Isolation often leads to depression and failure. Just think of someone who influenced, who influenced your life when you were in school. 
You know, we need to ensure that every student who graduates from our high school has had someone affect his or her life in a meaningful way. I serve on the school board with an open mind to new ideas and an enthusiasm to include as many people as possible in the decision-making process. Bethlehem. I have to stop you too. <laughs> Okay. I'm sorry. The rules of to me too. the rules of engagement. I should have, I should have, spoke, I should have spoken faster. But anyhow, well, I, I humbly ask for your vote on May 19th. Okay. Thank you. Okay. It's always a hard thing, especially at the end of the evening. And then we set out these rules. But I would like to uh, clap and thank our candidates yeah. for an informative and wonderful night. I, I have been told that this is going to go on your web page tomorrow and that there will be public access station also. So please don't make this just an academic evening. Make sure you vote, tell your friends about it, and thank you very much for coming out and speak to the candidates afterwards, please.